Dzięki Ci, miłościwy Panie, żeś nas od tatarskiej stali wyratował. Nie ma co, mu drogi. Jezu Maria! Oj, kurwa. Ach. What? Wait, what's the Stroin doing here? Hey, you guys are supposed to be charging the enemy right now. We got orcs coming out of our ass. So? What do you mean, so? That's your job. Go! Ach, for the love of... Oi! Who's there? Your friend over there doesn't speak a lick of common. Ah, uh, do not worry. Ah, uh, stray go vijinsne. Pratan! Opata? Opata. Jesu Maria! Oi, so! Salutations, Rangers! General Bradley 101 back at you again with some more lore. And today's video, ladies and gentlemen, we're taking a look at the Polish Wing Hussars as well as the Vestroyan Hussars. Now, this is part two to the Vestroyan miniseries because, uh, well, I just can't leave bloody enough well alone, can I? You can click over here for the full part that being the Vestroyan lore in its entirety. And let's find out exactly how the first Angels of Death from the 18th century influenced the ones that we know from the Grim Dark Far Future. So, how exactly did the Polish Wing Hussars get their name? Well, their origins lie in two cars, that being the lighter cavalry of the Hungarians, as well as a group of exiled Serbian knights. You see, after the Battle of Kosovo and the fall of the Serbian Empire to the Ottomans in the year 1394, a large majority of knights, men-at-arms and other forms of heavy cavalry from Serbia then departed their lands because uh, they didn't want to be ruled by the Ottomans, and they found work as a mercenary company in the lands of Hungary and later the Poland Lithuanian Commonwealth. Now, these mercenaries were apparently be known as Rasians, and they became a mercenary company that was particularly useful at countering Ottoman Sapahi and Delhi cavalry, particularly because they themselves were heavy cavalry formation, also they had a bit of a grudge between them. Couldn't imagine why. The Hungarian Hussars, on the other hand, were a light cavalry. Due to this, they were often used to support them. As the Russians would charge home with sabers in hand, the light cavalry would either draw them into said charge or protect them from the flanks. They were armed particularly with a rounded shield as well as a heavy slashing saber, but bows and other weapons were very common. Now this continued for about a hundred years or so, and then we get to 1503, in which the first two saw regiments were formed by the order of the Sejm that being the Polish parliament, and they begin to serve for a very good long about 67 years. Now, these are not the winged Hussar regiment, as these were very much Hungarian style Hussars, like Hussars used to support heavier cavalry and very much a skirmish cavalry, particularly useful in drawing in heavy elements, or protecting allied heavy elements, or raiding. And then we come in the year 1570, where you have the King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania, Stephen Barthry, who was later led by John III Sobieski, then reformed the Hussars to be a heavy cavalry with the king himself notably saying to drop the shield and take up the plate. Said plate being the heavy armor that they would be known for. Thus did the Hussars become an elite cavalry and were seen as the best of the best that the Polish had to offer, particularly because they were recruited from the Schlachter. The Schlachter were the Polish nobility. And over the next 30 years, they would continue to be adapted and recruited, getting heavier and heavier and incorporating more and more weapons. And eventually by the 17th century, they would be formed into what we know as the Husaria, that being Hussars. However, we don't exactly know when they got the iconical wings. But we can imagine it be somewhere about this time, given records from the 17th century start popping up about them having it. So, we can make that assumption. Now, the 17th century is often called the Golden Age of the Hussar for one very important reason. They were Poland's de facto unit. They were it. If you needed anything done, it was the winged Hussars that would get it done. Now, that's not to say that the other elements of the Polish army at the time were ineffective. Quite the contrary. The infantry and cavalry were often used to support the Hussars as a main effect and the Lithuanians themselves are known for having a very robust infantry set. But rather, the winged Hussars were the hammer, meant to smash apart the enemy or smash them upon the anvil that was the infantry. And we see that throughout the 17th century, time and time again, these units proved absolutely vital and the de facto reason why Poland won several important battles. We have the Battle of Lubitz in 1577, Biesnia in 1588, Klochehausen in 1601, Kirkom in 1505, Klusniko in 1610, Chochom in 1621, Martno in 1622, Trasnia in 1629, Orto in 1644, Bretskos in 1655, Polka in 1660, Chotow in 1660 again, Kolten in 1673, Lyuch in 1675, Vienna in 1683. the most famous one, and Parki in 1683. In time and time again, in each and every one of these battles, the winged Hussars won the day. Period. 
no debating. Not to mention, due to the nature of Poland and the enemies that it faced, these guys were often outnumbered. In the Polish Muscovite War during the Battle of Klusnikow, they were outnumbered 5 to 1 by the combined Muscovite and Swede force. Yet, the Muscovite and Swede force were heavily defeated, and the Polish sustained little to no losses and achieved a strategic victory. It's one of those things where you look at time and time again, it's like the Polish wing hussars in history canonically fought against superior foes time and time again, yet came off victorious. Not to mention, throughout Europe, especially in the West, they were seen as obsolete, because the idea of heavy cavalry was seen as a medieval bygone. Yet, time and time again, the Polish wing hussars proved to them that they were in fact not a bygone, but rather a devastating force to be feared. It is rather ironically, however, that the golden age of the Hussars would also signal its downfall, as the Battle of Vienna in 1683, the one where they were most notoriously famed for, they single-handedly shattered the Ottoman camp and forced them to fall back. And in some cases, some generous historians consider this to be the beginning of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, at least in its western holdings. However, after this major accolade, things would start to go south in Poland. You see, just before this was what was known as the time of the Deluge. The Deluge was essentially everyone and their mother fighting poor old little Poland. I guess some things never change. You have everyone from the Swedes to the Saxons to the Crimeans, the Muscovites and everyone in between, and even the Cossacks. I wish we would talk about it in the third video, look out for that. Rising up and fighting the poor old Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And during this time, yeah, they had it quite rough. Mainly because the things that made Poland unique were also the things that made Poland volatile. Allow me to explain. You see, the Poland Lithuanian Commonwealth was not a traditional monarchy in any sense. I mean, some people consider it not to be a monarchy in any sense of the word, which uh, I can't really agree with, but I get where they're coming from. You see, Poland did not run on a feudal system, per se, and instead run on what is known as an alut system. The alut system differed from the feudal system in that it was not necessarily a hereditary right granted by the king. No, no, no. Each man had his land, and that was his land, no one could revoke it, and it would be his son as long as his son continued to work it. And the only way it could be taken from him was if one, by war, or two, it was bought out. You see, in Poland, and Lithuania to a lesser extent, the idea of being an equal was very, very important. The king was not higher than the other schlachter. No, no, no. The king was on the same level as the schlachter, but he was first among equals. This then led to the Sejm, which was the Polish parliament and it actually held a great deal of power over the king. The king was still a very important figure and very respected, but he didn't have de facto authority, nor could he rule with an authoritarian fist, because the Sejm would just kick him out. Almost everything had to be voted for, and there was a funny enough a great deal of religious tolerance among them as well, with mosques as well as synagogues popping up next to churches. And while orthodoxy was the main Christian religion, Catholicism was present there, but it wasn't adopted by the state. Take a note of that, that will cause a problem later on. Moving on. And that brings me to my next point. You see, there was something known as the veto. For those who don't know what a veto is, it essentially is a no you button. Or a fuck you button, depending on how it's used. Or in Rome's case, both. A veto essentially allows a decree that was supposed to be passed to be stopped in its tracks and thus not passed. And the thing is though, every single member of the Sejm had one of these. So literally, if 99% of the Sejm agreed on this, 99.9%, .9 all it takes is for one Polish motherfucker to be like, Kurva, and there, done, it's fucked. So because of this, it meant that when Poland was good, it was really good, but all it took was one chap to mess everything up. And that's not just in regards to the whole parliamentary system, as well as the economical system as well. You see, Poland, like the East, was a bit slower to modernize compared to the West, mainly because there was very fertile farmlands. In Poland in particular, it was known for its exports of three things, grains, furs, and cattle. Therefore, it didn't make sense to just start modernizing completely and put such an effort into it when they had such an abundance of livestock and materials and land wealth to draw from, and they had been drawing on from it for a long time. And by the nature of the rights that many Polish citizens earned, small farmers were actually encouraged and actually built up the Polish economy. Combine that with a thriving merchant class, as well as a very understanding noble class, that then meant that Poland was able to thrive and become one of the richest countries in all of Europe. Okay, so why mention the Polish parliament and why mention the Polish economy, I hear you ask? Because as we've established, those two things are very volatile. When they work well, they work well. When they work bad, 
they work very, very fucking bad. And this is where we get into the deluge. The deluge lasted from approximately January 25th, 1648 to 1667 with the truce of Aradisvo. You see, there was something known as the Klinitsky Uprising. Remember those Cossacks? Yeah. See what had happened at first was... <laughs> was that the Polish crown and the Polish state decided to, you know, rejoin with the Catholic Church and mend the schism. The mainly Protestant Cossacks were not happy about this and rose up in rebellion as they were wont to do. What should have been a normal simple fight would have been sorted, uh, did not. Thus the Polish, who sent two separate armies there to fight them, lost. And it went from the Cossacks to the entire region uprising. And they decided to ally with Muscovy. And everything just went to shit from there. It was also at this time that Sweden and realizing that Lamau, we are also Vikings, decided to raid Poland. And I, I need you to understand something here. The destruction and havoc caused by the Swedes was said to be so great that it did not even compare to the destruction of the Germans and Russians in World War II. What, what the fuck? It is canonical. We have written accounts from all sides that when the Swedes invaded Poland, they stole literally everything, including, but not limited to, state records, floor tiles, roof tiles, glass, as well as some furnitures. Literally, when they raided and sacked Krakow, they literally stole the door hinges off the royal palace. I beg your pardon? I mean, the fuck, Sweden? Why? You, like, it, I know, but Jesus fuck, leave Poland alone. The whole bastard's already dead. Jesus. It also doesn't help at the time that John II Casimir, the said king of Poland, was, uh having a bit of a bad time. You see, he lacked severely in terms of support amongst the Schlachta, mainly due to his sympathies with Austria. Again, he wanted to sort of reunite the East and the West and build closer ties. Then you see that the, uh, the Schlachta, they weren't having that, which then led to him losing support and then the weak response, which then compounded itself. And eventually at the height of it, you had Poland, Lithuania, Russia, the Crimean Khanate, Austria, Brandenburg, Denmark, Norway, the Dutch Republic versus the Swedish Empire, Russia again, Brandenburg, the Cossack Hetemet, Transylvania, Moldova, Wallachia, and Lithuania. Yes, everyone and their mother was fighting each other. You notice how I mentioned Russia twice? Because Russia fought with Poland and then against Poland, and the Swedes were also involved, and then Germany got involved because, uh, you know, fuck it, if someone's invading Poland, join in because it's a party. It was very fucking messy. But during this time, Poland was devastated entirely. It is believed that in total, three million were said to have died in the conflict. A vast majority of that, with some estimates being well over one million, being Polish. And again, remember, what is Poland's main export? Grains and livestock. What happened to all the grain and livestock? The fucking Vikings took it and burnt the rest to the ground. The farmers that had been built up by Poland were mainly dead and devastated. The merchant class had nothing to trade. So what do you do when you have nothing to trade? You take your business and you go elsewhere. And the Schlachter, the Schlachter were also decimated and pissed. It's also during this time that while the Commonwealth would make up a good resurgence under, again, King John Sobieski III, that would not last long, as it would eventually be a small blip in the eventual decline. As at the turn of the 18th century, during the Swedish Wars, or the Swedish invasion of Poland, in 1701 to 1706, Poland would be resoundly beaten. Which would eventually start the good old European tradition of partitioning Poland. Seriously, it has four official partitions and three unofficial. Poor bosses can't catch a break. Poor Polska. It is also around this time that the Polish Hussar begins to decline. You see, the common rhetoric for other historians, and when people are covering this topic, is that the Polish Hussars declined simply because technology advanced and the cavalry became obsolete. Now, there is some merit to there, but the Polish Hussars had been seen time and time again being able to adapt and overcome. And we see very much so that a heavy cavalry only becomes completely obsolete at the turn of the mid 19th century, when rapid fire cannons as well as some machine guns were invented. It is known time and time again that the cuirassiers of a certain Napoleon Bonaparte were said to tear the Allied lines into pieces. The Polish wing Hussars were of a similar feign to said cuirassiers. They even used similar equipment in some cases. You see, the main reason why the Polish wing Hussars declined is not necessarily because they became ineffective, rather it's because they didn't have the means to adapt to prevent them becoming ineffective. You see, what ended up happening is that the gap between the Schlachter began to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, until eventually there became two classes of Schlachter, that being the princely Schlachter, but then also what were known as the 
Shlakta Zardoba or family nobility or farming nobility. Zagroda meaning farm. And these were often very different from the peasantry such citizenry of Poland itself. They were also known as Droba Shlakta or petty nobles or Shlakta Olezinka meaning local or impoverished nobles. Now we'll get onto this a little later but what you understand is that the Polish equipment was not super expensive, but it was not bloody cheap either. The only expensive thing that cost them was their horse, which we'll talk about later. So combine the fact that Poland was utterly devastated and economically in a recession from the seven layers of hell, in addition for their main source of recruits for this unit have been cut by at least 75%. And the fact that you're higher up, the people responsible for your leadership are currently in a state of trying to keep the bloody country together, it's not going well. Therefore, elite effective units like the Polish Wing Hussars often suffer. And we see that during the 18th century a steep decline. As Poland's fortunes get worse and worse and worse, so too do that of the Wing Hussars. With eventually, at the turn of the 18th century, Around the year 1776, the Polish Wing Hussars were resigned to being a parade unit and were either reverted back to a lighter Hussar variant or taken up by the Ulan, that being the German Hussar. And eventually they will be disbanded turn of the year in the 19th century. Mainly when Poland got gobbled up and chewed up and split and partitioned again because uh, yeah that kind of happens, damn it. Because it's kind of bloody hard to have an elite formation of a country when the country doesn't exist anymore. Poor Polska. Poor, poor, poor Polska. So again, we see here, while the old statement of Perry this, you filthy fucking casual, <laughs> not a shot, does indeed stand true. And that the Polish Wing Hussars would have to adapt themselves to combat this, the main reason why they fell is because they just couldn't be maintained anymore. Poland was falling apart by the seams, and everything that made Poland so unique was also the thing that kind of put it in the shitter. However, the spirit of the Winged Hussars continued to live on, and eventually as Polish persecution became more of a fad, they eventually began to be reformed. Not as an official unit per se, but rather the spirit of the Hussar, with today the first Polish armor division being known as the Husaria and bearing the banner and iconography of the Hussar. In addition to this, we see that while their actual historical use ended 700 years ago, in pop culture, everybody bloody loves them. Indeed, in Poland and in some cases Lithuania itself, it has become a very strong notion of the elite, the defiant, the fighting, the spirit of Eastern Europe, the spirit of true Polska itself. Because Polska's drunk. Not to mention, they look bloody beautiful. But now that we've covered the history of the Polish Wing Hussars, now let's take a look at their destroying counterpart. Blood for the blood! So, the Vostroyan Hussars. You see, Vostroya as a planet is primarily a manufacturing world, and it's known for its heavy infantry and heavy armor regiments. Now, while heavy armor regiments are not incredibly unrare, having whole regiments of Hussars, however, is extremely rare, which in fact mirrors that of the Polish Wing Hussars. You see, at any given time, the Polish Wing Hussars could only muster at maximum 10,000, but it was more often than not less than that, with in some cases there being 3,000 at the low ends, and in some cases there being 8,000 at the high ends. So, the Vestroyan Hussars are very much lesser to that. <sighs> so, the Vestroyan Hussars as a full regiment are very rare. You see, the standard import of Vestroyan are their heavy infantry regiments. And these will usually be accompanied by a few companies of tanks, as well as a few companies of destroying Hussars. But having whole regiments is incredibly rare. These Hussars are drawn from the Turkarchy, or the nobility of Vostroya. And they are said to be the only ones who seem to have a habit of keeping up husbandry, with it very much being a sign of wealth and leisure amongst the higher ends. Due to this, they are the only few people who know how to ride and manage these steeds. These steeds are heavily genetically modified compared to the standard unit, and in actuality have more in common with bears than they do actual horses. Combine this with the fact that they are often given armor, and in some cases augmetics, they become a very deadly unit. In the Vistroyan Firstborn, the idea of a brotherly bond is very much so amongst each other, with the idea that they are all Firstborn sons. So, most officers and nobility fight on foot as infantry, though there are a few officers who still love the idea of the cavalry, the true nobility of the knight. These are very free-thinking, very spirited, very strong-willed, and in some cases very chaotic individuals. They are noted for their aggression and daring, 
charging headlong into whatever may face them. And they have time and time again showed they are in fact a very effective unit. Despite what some officers in the Vestroyan may say as a whole, again, Vestroyans tend to prioritize their heavy infantry and heavy armor, with many of the officers in Vestroya not putting stock in these horse units, calling them bygone relics that they were not fit for a battle, and that a Lehman Ross battle tank could take care of anything that a Vestroyan heavy infantryman could not. And while yes, there is some truth in that statement, the Vestroyan Hussars have shown time and time again that they hit just as hard as a Lehman Rust tank. One of the main advantages that cavalry has over armoured is that they are not impeded by any form of terrain. This was shown perfectly in the defence of Danik's world. It was there that the 22nd Vestroyan Regiment, one of the few Husaria regiments that existed, engaged the orcs in the Quran's forest. The heavy infantry that was sent in there were having a hard time as the greater strength of the orcs proved ineffective in the harsh terrain. Combined with the fact that the armoured regiments could not push through there, the Vestroyan Hussars, however, using their magnificent modified steeds were able to smash through the orc lines. Their hunting lances and heavy sabers making short work of any orc forces that remained there. Though they remain a very small minority in the Vestroyan's arsenal. In addition to this, the Hussars have developed a strong reputation of defending ground. With them being often in very small units, they often face and encounter larger forces. The Hussars, however, have a very unique tactic, that being charging. As doctrine dictates amongst the Hussars, any Hussar officer will often charge the first ever thing that they see and attempt to break them in a charge, before returning back to base and reporting of the details. Combine this with everything that we previously discussed, and any destroying commander worth his salt will know that if you need a position held, or an enemy destroyed, get a company of Hussaria, and they'll be taken care of. Now that has been the history of the Polish Wing Hussars and the Rostroyan Hussars. Now, let's get on to their equipment. The so, Polish Wing Hussars first. The Polish Wing Hussars were armed with what is known as a demi plate. Demi plate essentially means a half plate or a three quarter plate, depending. They had the traditional padded gambeson as well, and some of them were known to make use of chainmail, though the chainmail would most likely be a chainmailed arming doublet rather than a full set of a halberd, though it depended. Now, this was comprised of a cuirass, which was a full armored breastplate, spalders or pauldrons, arm braces, as well as cuisses. Cuisses were essentially a thigh protection. Now, this was not a solid full set of a thigh, rather, it would only be the first half that covered the thigh. Due to the nature of him being a horseman, it didn't necessarily need the second half, and it saved less weight and money. In addition to this, the spalders and bevers would provide protection for the entirety of the arm, and the braces rounded it off, with the breastplate being made of high quality. It's also very possible that a gorget would be included from time to time, depending on the particular hussar in question. In addition to this, they were a bourguignon, or a lobster-tailed pot helm, and to round it off they had a very thick heavy-duty pair of leather jack boots. The helm in particular was known to be decorated in various fashions, and often have very various face guards, the most iconic being this one pictured here. Another piece of kit that they had was their iconic wings. Now, some historians are still out on what exactly these wings do per se, but we do know that they were used in battle and not just as a ceremonial, as they were either attached to the breastplate itself or the back of the saddle, and would provide an extra layer of defense against sword strikes and other blows to the back. These were shafts of wood that were then covered in various ostrich slash eagle feathers, and would strike a very imposing figure, as they not only made the Hussar look bigger, but when charging, they would give the image a flapping and fluttering, as if the Hussar was indeed winged. In addition to this, they were said to make a vicious noise in terms of both clattering against one another and the rider, but also a horrific shrill whistling as the air passed through the small holes in the wooden banks. Now this was meant to do two things. One, it was meant to frighten the other horses and the opposing enemy, and two, it was meant to keep the horse of the Hussar focused on the noise around him so that he could not hear the actual noise of the battlefield. And I need to mention something. We as modern day humans, we've seen a lot of crazy shit. Like, I know what the fuck a gene stealer is. Right? Die, heretic! Maybe just one read. No. It was not Keck, it was Cringe Father. But you understand, your standard chap back in the day didn't even leave his own goddamn town, let alone experience anything. He didn't see anything. So he may have heard of the winged Hussars, but he never seen them before. I want you to imagine if you were a dude, 
You're a soldier, you know how to fight. You've been fighting humans all your life. You rock up to fight one day, then all of a sudden, a mech from Titanfall lands up and charges at you. You would be fucking mortified. So when you see the Hussars, decorated in bright red colors, wearing these beautiful crafted ornate arms and armor, wearing these massive fiery wings that flutter and clatter and shrill in the wind, on top of that, having leopard skins or animal skins, a vicious feline predators, all of the while having massive red and white banners and in some cases their horses being colored red and white charging at you screaming Jesu Maria for Polska all the while you're supposed to sit there and take that the sheer psychological impact that you would have from that type of charge would shatter and rout anyone. Hence, why the Polish relied on it so much. However, while the morale impact of that charge would be absolutely devastating and added into the actual combat capability of the Hussars, what allowed the Hussars to really hit home were the various lances. The lance was what is known as a copia. The copia was approximately 6 meters long, which was a full meter long than the standard pike length at the time, that being 5 meters. Now, how is it that a Polish wing Hussar was able to wield such a massive wieldly lance when on foot, planting it in the ground, a 5 meter pike was still something that was bloody terrible to use. Simple. The sneaky poles made the bloody thing hollow. Because it was hollow, it was able to be much longer, yet still be the same weight, and had actually aided in its devastating force, as due to the physics of it, a hollow lance was able to exert more force and thrust and thus have more pack and impulse. The downside being that it broke very easily, and that was okay. The Hussars were designed to strike, hit target with all the force of guard, shatter their lance, then go back to the camp, pick up another, and then continue cycle charging. In addition to this, they were armed with two sabers. The Concerge, which was a straight dual-edged heavy stabbing saber. Now this was particularly used against cavalry, as the Polish one who saw would extend his arm out, straighten it, and sort of act it as a lance. This was often used to get into between the gaps of heavy armor, or in some cases hit the heavy arm itself. Due to the heavy nature of the saber, a good strike to the head may not kill a man, but it will certainly incapacitate him. In addition to this, they had the slatzba. The slatzba being a heavy Polish slashing saber. Now this thing was the main Polish Hussar's weapon, as it was far longer than the standard saber of the time, more akin to that of a longsword per se. A short longsword, mind you, but still. And with its vicious wicked curve, it was able to cut down deep into running, fleeing infantry. What was unique about it is that unlike most sabers, it was actually double-edged, but only at the very tip. Meaning that in some cases, that since it was double-edged at the tip, it could be used as an effective stabbing weapon, but in a weird arcing manner. As you see very clearly, users of the Polish Slazba developed this weird type of arcing movement where these heavy sabers would do a thick, wide, heavy strokes, slashing and cutting and keeping the enemy at bay. It developed its own unique fighting style, which was very popular amongst the Polish nobility and was used for recreational and horrific duels at the time. In addition to this, it made it incredibly effective at combat. Thus, the Polish Hussar and the Polish Saber became something rightly feared by everyone around them. Though when they needed something a bit more heavier, war hammers and battle axes were very common and much loved amongst them. They were also known to carry firearms, being either pistols, usually four to six at a time, and in some cases a carbine, known as a bandoliet. In addition, bows were very common amongst their ranks, as archery was still a sign of the nobility, and many nobles in Poland were skilled archers. As for the horse, the horse itself didn't necessarily have any barding. An armored saddle was not uncommon, and in some cases I have seen there be light forms of barding, but generally speaking, they went without it. However, the Polish horse was a unique mix. This was known as the Husaria, or the Husaria horse, specifically because it was combined and crossbred for a very specific reason. It was crossbred with the lighter eastern variants used by raiding of the Tatars, in conjunction with the heavier versions of western Destrias. Thus the result was a medium sized steed which had the speed and agile maneuverability of eastern horses, yet the durability, sheer physical impact and aggressiveness found in larger western breeds. The Polish winged Hussar horse was such a closely guard kept secret by the Polish state that it was quite literally illegal on pain of death for anyone to sell that horse outside of Poland. And this bloody thing was actually more expensive than the armor that the dude wore. This was said to cost up to a whole small village. Was this an exaggeration? Perhaps. But the fact of the matter that even if it is an exaggeration, that's still a lot of money for a horse. I mean, look at that. Polska pony.
Bloody hell. However, it is because of this horse that the Polish Wing Hussars were able to operate in the way that they did. They were able to strike with such a ferocious momentum, yet still be able to maneuver out of it relatively easily. An often issue with heavy cavalry is that when they hit home, it is very much hard for them to pull out immediately. Due to the nature of it, they often drive deep and long, and stopping cavalry shot is not an easy feat, which means that most often cavalry have two options. You either go through the enemy, or try and maneuver out. But maneuvering out was very much a difficult thing, due to the heavy nature of the heavy armor and horses used by western armies. The winged hussars, however, they did not have this issue, as their steeds were smaller, more of a medium size, and were incredibly maneuverable. Combined with the fact that they were highly trained, it was very common for Polish hussars to slam into an enemy, shatter their lances, fight with the saber for a few hits, pull back, grab another lance, and shatter them again. And they would continue making this charge again and again and again and again and again and again until the enemy broke. And the Polish Hussars were notoriously stubborn for doing this. During a battle against the Swedes, the Polish Hussars were said to have charged 10 times before the stalwart Swedish infantry eventually broke under the ferocious melee. Not to mention, the Polish Lance, the Kopia, was said to be a devastating weapon. There are written accounts of several sources that the Polish Lance was able to impale several men upon a charge, with one account giving us 5 to 6 Russians impaled upon a single lance. Combined with this fact that Polish Hussars were often ready and willing and able to fight on foot, surprisingly enough, we have several accounts of them holding ground or holding crossings, again having them to fight on foot. Moreover, the most dangerous thing about Hussar was neither his horse nor his gear, but rather his sheer bloody mentality. The only way to get rid of a Hussar was to kill the bloody bastard. Which moves me on very nicely to the Vestroyan Hussars. The Vestroyan firstborn already have this sense of duty and determination that rivals that of any guard regiment. You can find the fact that the Vestroyan Hussars often feel like they have something to prove, as again they are seen by Vestroyan wider command as being not necessarily that important. It then leads you to a group of men who would rather die than ever shirk their duty. They are armed very much so like their counterparts, except they have full carapace armor plate, as well as chain swords, power swords, and the hunting lance. The hunting lance is essentially a very long lance, but it has a shape charge tip at the end of it meaning that it is incredibly deadly against any form of heavy armor or heavy infantry. In addition to this, the Vestroyan firstborn Hussar will also carry a las pistol, or a bolt pistol in some cases, power axes, power mauls, and they will often carry a anti-infantry lance as well, because fuck infantry. The Vestroyan Hussars are known very much for their heavy charge. In some cases, they will actually outright charge the enemy in totality, or, again, the hammer and anvil is a very popular tactic amongst the Vestroyan units who make use of Hussars. For the Vestroyan heavy infantry are able to hold and take the charge, while the anvil then circle behind and strike them from the rear. Time and time again, the Vestroyan Hussars have charged home to an enemy, absolutely slaughtering them. We have several accounts amongst the Elder and Tau, and noted that how these particular units were incredibly effective against them. As the Vestroyan Heavy Saber, often usually formed in a chain sword configuration, is hilariously deadly to any form of lighter infantry. In addition to this, they can often be armed with crack grenades as well as frag grenades and anything really. But more than that, their steeds are of a particular note. Again, much like the Polish Wing Hussars, genetically bred and augmented, though these guys are bred specifically for speed as well as durability, with again their accounts of being able to take several heavy bolt rounds to the chest, yet the steed will keep going. However, unlike the Death Riders of Krieg, these steeds are not disposable, as each one of them is seen as a family heirloom, and is meant to be taken care of and is shown with the utmost pride and appreciation by the Destroyer men. So, we covered tactics, we covered recruitment, we covered history. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's wrap up. The Polish Dwinged Hussars, truly an iconic unit of history, a source of pride and a sense of utter determination and resilience, a hallmark of Poland itself. Now, to end this off, I want to mention a certain battle. Now, I know that a few of you may be screaming, Brad, you didn't mention the Siege of Vienna. Well, that's because you already know what happened. 15,000 Polish cavalry, led by 3,000 elite heavy hussars, smashed home and utterly routed the besieging force of the Ottoman Empire. You know that. You know the song. I mean, hell, if you know the song, you know enough of history as is. But this was not a one-off. And I want to talk about something that's even crazier to you. You see, approximately 11 years after the Siege of Vienna, in the year 1694, there was a battle by the known of Khaldo, where a group of 400 Polish cavalry, 100 of them being the heavy hussars, the other 300 being Lisłoczki, that being light Tatar-style cavalry, and Panzeni, medium-style heavier cavalry, were sent to stop a raid of the Tatars. When they went to the particular area, 
they found 700 Tatar horsemen. And they thought, right, no problem. They then slammed into them at Mark 10 and utterly slaughtered half of them in the charge, causing the other half to flee. And they thought, right, job's done, back home. It turns out, however, that these units were actually the vanguard of a much larger force. How large? 40 thousand. Hey yo, what the fuck? It was at this point, the leader of the unit, that being one Konstanty Zabrowski, then decided to pull back to the town of Hadel, as that even the daring hussars realized that charging into that massive horde of 40,000 be an absolute death sentence. So, do the hussars and the other Polish cavalry dismount and begin fighting on foot, defending the town. For the next six hours, the 40,000 Tutars threw everything at them. The Polish eventually ran out of bullets, then resorted to using improvised arrowheads as ammunition for their rifles, as well as actual arrowheads themselves. In addition to this, the Tars eventually threw everything at them in a melee charge, and the Polish repelled them single-handedly. Eventually, the Tatars would send a Polish-speaking envoy to them, with the Tatar commander essentially begging them to surrender, saying, Hey, look, there's only 400 of you, we're 40,000, you guys are gonna die, please, for the love of God, just surrender so we can get this over with. It was then, the Konstanty Zabris replied, Come and get us if you can, mirroring the court of Leonidas several thousand years ago. Come and take them. It was at this time that the Tatars then withdrew and gave up on the raid entirely, having gained absolutely nothing and losing approximately 2,000 men, while the Hussars lost fewer than a quarter of their number. Funny thing is though, these were only a hundred Hussars. If they had a full 400, nah, those Tatars would have been in the dust. This is 400 against 40,000 outnumbered for 1 to 100, and these guys still managed to win. I don't have to say anything else about the combat capability of the Winged Hussars, but what I do want to talk about is their defiant nature. Poland as a country has been through a lot of shit. Again, seven partitions, four official, three not. Yet one thing that has been there is the sense of determination, of defiance. Poland is often known as a little country that could. It would never yield, it would never bend, and while you think you may break it, it will always come back. Throughout every single period of Polish occupation, a certain culture has developed, that being the culture of Polania, or Poles outside of Poland. Several Polish communities have popped up all over the world, and they have continued time and time again to show Polish culture and keep it alive and fight. But several times, especially during World War II, Polish contingents making up vast numbers of units and working far above their expected combat capabilities for a unit of that size. The Polish Dwing Hussars represent defiance. They represent the nobility of Poland, they represent the best of the best, the gleaming angels of Poland, clad in heavy armor, gilded with gold, wearing vicious animal pelts, and of course, their dazzling wings, striking home with lance in hand, never fearing, never bending, never breaking, shattering enemy after enemy after enemy, and despite how many times their enemies may break them, the spirit of the winged hussars, the spirit of Poland, continues above all else. And while the Vestroian Hussars have never had their planet cut in half before, or partitioned by several angry governors, Vestroia itself will not yield. Vestroia will make amends for what it has done, and the firstborn sons of Vestroia ride atop proudly their mighty steeds, for they are true servants of the Emperor. They are true servants of the Imperium, and nothing, no foe, no matter how big or how small, no matter how much they are outnumbered by, will dare stop them as they continue their duty. And in that sense, the winged hussars of Poland and the Vestroian hussars of the firstborn are very much the same unit. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. That has been the Polish winged hussars and the Vestroian hussars. Episode 2 of the four-part mini-series on the Vestroian firstborn, because I just can't help myself. As always, sources will be stated down below. These are official tertiary institute verified sources so you don't have to worry about them i know that some people like to use youtube videos for research in their papers i did as well when i was in university so here you go i made your life a whole bunch easier for you also a massive and sincerely heart warm thank you to lydia for helping me out with that awesome polish at the beginning and making sure i nail those pronunciations you can check out some of the artwork here i would list you socials but she is not social lamau so just leave her an awesome comment. But if y'all like that video, then I can guarantee you guys are gonna absolutely adore this one over here about the vaunted Solar Auxilia. Click here to learn more about the mortal men that even Space Marines feared. But without any further ado, I have been General Bradley 101. You've been beautiful, awesome, and amazing people. Thank you all so very much for watching. Make sure to stay resolute out there, boys and gals, and I will catch y'all next time. Dismiss, Rangers! Discuss trunk.